President Slobodan Milosevic. What the demonstrations have demonstrated is how fluid political opinions have become. Hardline supporters of President Milosevic have turned against him, and the principal beneficiaries so far have been the clutch of smaller parties who have taken the lead in the street campaign. Until now, Mr. Draskovic, who heads the only substantial opposition party, had refused to join them. He showed his change of mind in a BBC interview the and deliberately targeted members of President Milosevic's party. I'm not ready to tell right now to the people of Serbia, look, vote for opposition. Let's go to arrest Milosevic, let's go to kill him or something like that. And after that, uh, we must fill up the prisons in Serbia by supporters of Milosevic. No, I'm not ready to take any one step uh, which uh, could uh, provoke civil war in Serbia. And by the way, we are very, very close to the possibility of, of civil war. Vuk Draskovic was one of the leaders of Serbia's last great street protest in 1996, only later to desert his colleagues and join the government. But however wary they will be of his motives this time, his party will substantially strengthen the campaign against President Milosevic. Mr. Draskovic is credited with very sharp political instincts, so the significance of his move is not just the number of people he can call on, but his judgment that President Milosevic is now so weakened that this is the right moment to turn on him. Brian Hanrahan, BBC News, Belgrade. Michael Schumacher will miss at least the next four Grand Prix following his crash at Silverstone yesterday and says he now has no hope of winning the championship. He's had surgery for a broken leg at Northampton General Hospital. He's expected to be released tomorrow and admits that he's lucky to be alive. It was the moments which struck horror into everyone who saw it. Michael Schumacher hurtling arrows straight towards the barrier and powerless to do anything about it. In that instant, it was chillingly reminiscent of the crash which caused Ayrton Senna's death five years ago. But this time, the safety improvements made since to cars and tracks had averted disaster, as the Ferrari team acknowledged today. Fortunately, the cars are very strong. Uh, it's a lot which has been done on, uh, on safety, and uh, I wonder what would have happened a few years ago with such an accident. Doctors say Michael Schumacher will remain in hospital for at least another day after having a metal plate inserted in his broken leg. He's expected to make a full recovery, but he'll be out of action for a minimum of two months. And his team will want to know what went wrong. Tests on his car suggest rear brake failure. The data we have is certainly not inconsistent with that. And uh, further investigation will show what happened. But it was certainly not an ordinary accident. It wasn't a question of him simply going too fast and losing control. Meanwhile, other drivers are concerned that the wide gravel trap didn't appreciably slow him down. If you have a spinning car, then definitely gravel works very well. But as we've seen many times before, if you have a car going straight, then it doesn't do anything for you. Uh, the key thing is that the car should never be able to penetrate the tyre barrier and hit the wall at the other side, which I think happened in, in Michael's case. In the pits, they'll also inevitably be asking what effect such a smash will have on the man and his nerve. Well, this is the first time that Michael Schumacher has injured himself and uh, that's going to make him aware of his own vulnerability now. He will get right back to that um, dominant form he's had, but it'll take a while. I can see it being next year. Overall, though, Formula One is feeling collective relief. Its safety measures have worked, and though its principal star's world championship hopes have gone this year, at least he'll be back. Kevin Geary, BBC News. The United States and Canada could ban some British meat, fruit and chocolate for encouraging forced marriages. Sue Lloyd-Roberts reports. The daily queue outside the British High Commission in Islamabad. Mostly men applying for the right to join new wives who are already British citizens. Until recently, they would have been questioned closely to establish whether the marriages were genuine or ones of convenience. But under the new laws, staff here can no longer do that. And they say the number of applicants has more than doubled and many young wives are being forced to endorse applications against their will. Razia, who's from Bradford, sponsored her husband to come to the UK, but he's abandoned her and married another girl here in Pakistan. She wants to make sure that the staff at the commission don't let him send for wife number two. She says it's typical of the way British Asian girls are being treated. It's like we're giving them the, the passport so that they can use us and abuse us and then call over their families and friends and 
whoever they want. And a second wife. And a second wife. It's a sad irony that because there's no one to help these girls in Pakistan, it's only when they come here to Britain and after they've been abused, beaten or abandoned by their husbands that they can find help from support groups and the police here. Okay, thank you everybody for coming today. Razia, now back in Bradford, has got together with other women to launch Our Voice to lobby for changes in the law, which they complain doesn't do enough to restrain the male members of the community, like her husband, whom I questioned outside the taxi company where he works. She says that you have married again in Pakistan, although you're still married with Razia. Yeah. But you are already married. So? I am Muslim. Muslim can get married twice, three, three times, four times. It's not a problem. And whether women like it or not, local custom dictates that they go back to Pakistan to marry a member of the extended family there. Like 18-year-old Nisha, who's now in a secret refuge with a new identity organized by the police. When I was 16, the parents took me to Pakistan to get married. They locked me up and starved me until I agreed. My husband beat me, starved me and raped me. So when I got back to England, I refused to get him over. And so my family years started to beat me. I feared for my life, so I ran away. But local custom aside, all this is forbidden by Islam, according to one of Britain's leading Muslims. It condemns forced marriage. It is inhuman. And in Islam, marriage is a social contract where consent of both parties is essential. Without consent, the marriage is null and void. In fact, the situation is any sexual relationship within forced marriage is rape. Addressing a public meeting in the area, Immigration Minister Mike O'Brien says the government doesn't plan to change the law. It's up to the Asian community to put its own house in order. So that the small minority of arranged marriages which are forced can be stopped by the community working with us to try to ensure that women in particular are not forced into that situation. The reaction from male community leaders and parents is not encouraging. Razia hands a petition to the minister from local women who believe that the men in their community will never change unless forced to. Sue Lloyd Roberts, BBC News, West Yorkshire. And there's more on that story in Newsnight on BBC Two at half past ten. The Iranian authorities tonight banned any demonstrations planned for tomorrow in Tehran. His last of the summer wine has died. He was 85. He was taken ill last month while filming a special edition of the program and was found to be suffering from stomach and bowel cancer. Nick Hyam reports. It's the world's longest running television comedy, set in an innocent world where old age is truly a second childhood, from Bill Owen's compo more than most. When he first read the script, he said, he thought it pure gold. Uh, the whole idea of the series uh, of these three old codgers, you know, waking up every day and taking it by the scruff of the neck and doing something with it. And um, I knew it was special, and for once in my life, I was right. Before the summer wine, Bill Owen spent 40 years as a jobbing actor and entertainer. Everything from left-wing reviews to Butlins, including Shakespeare opposite Catherine Hepburn on Broadway. But it was in Last of the Summer Wine, as one of the three ageing layabouts in an old-fashioned corner of England, that he became a household name. The scruffy compo's unrequited love for Nora Batty and their often tempestuous relationship was central to the series' gentle humour. I don't know why he never got an award for it because it was the f it was the best character uh, performance uh, in a comedy role that uh, has ever been seen during his time. I would say. A Londoner, Bill Owen became an honorary Yorkshireman and bought a house in the series location Holmfirth, showing that even its stars succumbed, like millions of viewers, to the magic in the summer wine. My last wish is to be buried here in Homeford for the simple reason I feel I belong here now. I want to be here in spirit sometime. Bill Owen, who died this afternoon. Now back to Northern Ireland for many unionists.